trip at Santiago de Compostela, the cathedral that is located at the legendary tomb of St. James the Greater. This is not my topic for my sermon today, although it will hopefully provide future sermon inspiration. But I tell you this as way of preface for something I've learned in my preparation for this journey. In Barcelona stands the Sagrada Familia, the architectural masterpiece of Antony Gaudi, a magnificent church that was begun in 1883 but which is not expected to be finished until 2026. Some of you may have visited there, and many of you may have seen photos of it. Rick Steves describes this church as supersized and having a cake in the rain facade. <coughs> have you seen the pictures? Like a Gothic cathedral of old, La Sagrada Familia is a work in progress. Currently, there are only four spires, but when completed, it will have 18 total. The tallest will be the 400-foot tower dedicated to Mary and the 560-foot Jesus Tower, which will have a lighted cross visible at sea. Awe-inspiring. A wonder to behold. But for now, it is more museum than church. Their website actually says no services are being held there. The Pope did hold a consecration mass there when it became a basilica in 2010. But their website doesn't show any evidence of outreach, though I dare say the employment of many skilled workers and artisans is a form of outreach. The website states the Sagrada Familia is a symbolic expression in stone of the Christian faith. In this temple, an exaltation of the family of Nazareth as a model for a united family, Christians, especially Roman Catholics, can recognize the tenets of their faith. Like the, likewise, those who profess a different faith, or none at all, can and all find in it the keys for understanding the Christian religion, the history of the church, the sacred scriptures, the tradition of dedication to the saints, Christian doctrine, and worship. This is a wonderful goal, and I look forward with great anticipation to seeing this masterful artistic work, as much as I look forward to the Picasso Museum nearby. But part of me asks, is this how Jesus would view a church? which brings me back to today's gospel. For a moment, I would like you to put yourselves in the sandals of Jesus' disciples. <coughs> Peter, John, and James, as they wearily climbed the mountain and gained a new vision of Jesus. The transcendent visionary portions of this transfiguration story are so overwhelming, even just in the reading. What might it have been like to witness it firsthand? Jesus is so transplendent, his face changes and his clothes become a radiant white. He is so different from the man the disciples knew as friend and teacher. And the very superstars of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, make an appearance. For heaven's sake, they're standing right there with him. And we know, too, by what happens next, that this is not a meeting of peers. We know because God appears in a terrifying cloud and tells them, This is my son, my chosen Listen to him. God himself sets Jesus apart from Moses and Elijah. God affirms Jesus as the Messiah. So something awesome has occurred. And in an effort to normalize things, to bring them back to a human scale, the ever-impetuous Peter goes toward a familiar, comfortable place and thinks maybe he can enshrine the experience 
in a monument. Specifically speaking, Peter thinks it would be a good idea to build three dwelling places, or tabernacles, for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Now, were tabernacles really such a terrible idea? And what is a tabernacle anyway? A tabernacle was a sacred tent in which God met with his people. It was seen as God's dwelling place among them. The nomadic Israelites of the Old Testament created an elaborate tabernacle where sacrifices and atonements occurred. The tabernacle was to the Jews very much what the sanctuary of St. Francis Church is to us, a place of worship, prayer, and sacrifice, though our sacrifices tend to come in pledge envelopes. It's also a place to connect with God. The Israelites decorated their tabernacle with beautiful curtains, lights, and decor. The congregations of St. Francis created these lovely windows, the gracious, welcoming nave, and the architectural details that make this such a pretty place of worship. We have established a place for God to be among us. But, much like Peter, we can get trapped in trying to enshrine God or his son Jesus in one place. If we focus heavily on maintaining the status quo, on building shrines to ideas of the past, like tabernacles for Moses and Elijah, or magnificent museum-like edifices, we are no longer truly listening to Jesus. Jesus wants us to have enough faith to take God out into the world. You, like Peter, may have experienced times in your life when you try to enshrine the good things with your own personal monuments. I know I have. We have just come out of the Christmas season, and my sister Cindy and I had a recent epiphany, <laughs> pun intended, about how we celebrate Christmas with our extended family. For about 30 years, at either my sister's or my home, we have had a family gathering based on the gathering of our parents and our maternal grandparents before us, where we have a sit-down dinner to which all are invited. <coughs> but the family has grown with the addition of spouses, children, grandchildren, friends. The dinner and gift opening have become an enormous affair. We have modified things over the years. We now do a gift drawing. And we have rules so everyone focuses on whomever is opening a gift at any given time. And we switched what we now call the Christmas hoopla from Christmas Day to the Saturday after Christmas. But it seemed of vital importance to us to do things just as we had always done them. Dinner is always roast beef with mashed potatoes and homemade gravy just like it was when we were kids and when my mother was a kid before us. Each of the family members brings a side, appetizer, rolls, salad, vegetable, etc. You probably do the same kind of thing at your house. And for dessert, we always have a flaming plum pudding. Now, the plum pudding is a sacred part of our tradition. It must have come from my great-grandmother's Irish background. We turn out the lights and gather around the table and sing Christmas carols as it burns down. The longer it burns, the better luck we will have in the coming year. So, of course, we always pour lots of brandy on it. <laughs> the kids, as they grow older, teach the younger kids to dip their fingers into the flaming brandy so they can hold the fire. One year, my grandniece played We Wish You a Merry Christmas by ear on her violin as it burned. It is the very heart of our celebration, and every year I think as we experience it that this is one more Christmas, and what a privilege it is to be part of this wonderful family. Of course, of the 22 people around the table, only four of them will even eat plum pudding. The rest have ice cream and cookies. 
But I don't think anyone would want to give up this time of communion. <coughs> However, no matter how hard we try, the brunt of the enormous meal normally falls on the hosts. <coughs> this seems fun and exciting sometime in no late November. It becomes overwhelming and exhausting when you are doing the major house cleaning and very hot and irritating when you are standing over the stove stirring the gravy at the last minute and you realize there aren't enough mashed potatoes. My sister and I no longer enjoy the event as much as we would like because of this. We don't get to mingle. Sometimes we feel resentful, not a good feeling. And we want others to pick up the slack. But is that really fair to them? It is pretty expensive to host such an event. And families that live in Nevada or Chico aren't central enough to really make it happen easily. And another revelatory thing happened this year, which made us realize that the event had lost sight of the true spirit of Christmas. A wonderful family friend had thought they were invited. We had purposely not invited this person in an effort to keep numbers down and the event manageable. And one of our family had to let the friend know this. This person was very hurt. It saddened our hearts. And we never want to do that again. We want to make all welcome at the table. So about that epiphany. In one of our regular confabs the other night, Cindy and I realized something we already knew in our hearts. The gathering isn't about roast beef and mashed potatoes. It isn't about special punch or fabulous table decor. It is about family coming together and enjoying each other's company and loving each other and getting to know each other again, especially in the light of Christ's love for us. The huge Christmas dinner has been enshrined like a prehistoric mastodon in an iceberg. It was no longer alive for us. The moments that are truly alive are those when we serve the plum pudding. We decided that next year we will keep the plum pudding, but ask people to bring only finger foods and desserts we will have more time for each other and more time to invite others. And we will have room for all at the table. And maybe someday the plum pudding too will burn itself out and we will do something new then. But for now it will remain a lively, key word, lively family tradition. This is what I think God is saying to Peter, John, and James when he asks them to listen to his son. He is saying he does not want frozen in time tabernacles. He wants them to listen to Jesus and go out into the wor world with faith and love to do his work here on earth. That is the best monument to faith. And he wants them to invite others to the table. He wants a lively faith at work in the world, not an enshrined faith, no matter how tall or how many spires there may be on the shrine. I believe St. Francis is coming to embody that kind of faith as we move out our church doors into the community. In the light of so much upheaval and change, some of us have been silent, like the apostles, waiting to see what God will say next. Our annual meeting has shed some light on the path we may take. As we partner with other churches on our campus and in our area, we have more potential to do good works in the world. Winter Sanctuary, where St. Francis will help with feeding the homeless, is one way to get beyond our four walls. 
We embody faith as we come to realize that the church is not an edifice frozen in time and that the edifice itself can serve us to do more outreach. As individuals, when we walk in the sandal steps of the apostles, we have the potential for miracles too. Jesus wants us to listen to him. He will guide our path along the way. Listen with particular care to the Gospels in the coming year, or review them in your Bible. Listen and allow Jesus' words to help lay out a blueprint for our future. If we listen to Jesus, he will bring about our true transfiguration as individuals and as the living stones of St. Francis Church. Amen. Amen.